Right on cue, just like we predicted, we're seeing regional banks collapse in the United States, global reserve currencies on the brink of collapse, central banks intervening, elevated inflation everywhere around the world, which inevitably lead to the same outcomes that we've always seen for the last 500 years. We look at the impacts of money printing and the abuse of sovereign currencies over the last six centuries, and they all have the same eventual outcome. Will governments ever learn their lesson? Welcome to the Bitcoin Daily Show. I'm Dante Cook, head of Swan Business. Some say that history doesn't repeat itself, but I don't know after looking at some of these clips side by side with Michael Jordan. Anthony Edwards, or Ant-Man, dropped 40 as the Timberwolves swept the Suns and he did it shooting over 50% from the field and from three. He dominated the game physically, athletically. He was just the overall best player on the court. And it shows that he's the next one up, just like Bitcoin. But that's a whole different topic. And just like Anthony Edwards' game looking very similar to Michael Jordan's, we see regional banking collapses happening the same exact way this year as they did last year. Last year in April, First Republic Bank collapsed and was taken under control by California regulators. And almost exactly a year later, its doppelganger bank, Republic First Bank, collapsed on April 26 with $6 billion in assets, $4 billion in deposits, and it's estimated it will have a $677 million impact to the FDIC reserves. And just like the regional banking collapses we saw almost a year ago, there are many everyday Americans and businesses who had deposits above $250,000, and they are going to learn the hard reality and hard lesson. The money that we have deposited into banks isn't actually ours. People are learning about the true mechanics of our fictional reserve banking system, where they're supposed to have up to 10% of your assets, but they lend those dollars out at a 10 to 1 ratio in order to earn money with that leverage, putting your dollars or their dollars that you're lending to them at risk. And as we move forward, there will continue to be more regional banking collapses. And the government is going to have to let nature take its course, and more everyday Americans are going to get hurt. Or, like the Bank of Japan, they're going to have to intervene, whose currency collapsed to 34-year lows to the U.S. dollar overnight. And in a blink of an eye, their currency course corrected, showing that this wasn't just the market buying the dip. This was actually central banking intervention. It's rumored that the Bank of Japan sold its dollar reserve assets in order to prop up their own currency. Like I said before, they say history doesn't repeat. But I think it actually rhymes. If you look at this great post and image from Swan Managing Director John Har, you'll see that over the course of time, their crises aren't actually that much different. But what you can see clearly when you look at the chart closely is that they are just getting bigger and bigger, and the measures used to stop these crises are getting far larger. If you look at the Fed's balance sheet, it's grown from $2 trillion when Ben Bernanke said it was going to go back to a $1 trillion, yeah, right, to almost $9 trillion today. Along with that, you have the growth in mortgage-backed securities, and you also see the growth of U.S. Treasuries, or debt being created in order to be monetized, in order to float and prop up the system. By expanding the money supply and creating new monetary units, you always have the same outcome. You get inflation. People feel richer in the short term. As you can see when you look at this chart, the NASDAQ or the value of the NASDAQ has gone up just as much as the creation of new money supply or the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. But what you don't see is the cost of real everyday goods and services that that amount of value acquires, which continues to go down and down, and you have the squeeze. This is what inevitably happens to every single government and every single currency. I love this clip from Max Hillebrand from Peter McCormick's latest conference, Cheat Code in Bedford. He highlights the impacts of inflation, and not just the ones that we talk about on the surface, but the underlying issues that it causes in business creation and production and manufacturing of goods. Inflation is a decrease in, in purchasing power. Right? That's if only inflation were, were only the decrease in purchasing power of money. Right? That would be great. In, inflation is so, so, so much more worse than that. It's almost unbelievable. Right? So inflation is the increase of the money supply 
Full stop. That's it. You have a base money, 100 units, you make it 150 units, that's inflation. Full stop. Very simple. So what are the consequences of inflation? Sure, the, the value of that token will go down, right? Because larger supply, same demand, means lower price. Obvious. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting is what happens to the entrepreneurial processes, to the production stages. And, and um, here, once uh, those people who receive the newly created money first, they will think, hey, hey look, I got marginally more money. I'm, I'm rich. Right? Where can I spend it on now? And they will spend it on the next best possible investment. And, and, and cool, now they, they've invested the money there, so we print more money, and where are we going to uh, invest that money next? Well, obviously, it has to be an investment that is marginally worse than the investment we just did earlier. Because if the second investment would be much better, well, we should have invested in it first. Right? So diminishing marginal returns. We first invest our money into the most valuable projects, and then the next best one, and the next best one, and so on. Which means the more money we print and the more we invest the worse and worse and worse the quality of the investments will be. We will start producing shit that nobody needs and nobody wants because we think that we're all rich. Right? Well, well, simultaneously, what happens when we print money uh, is that on the consumption side, you know, we all get a pay raise, great. Now, we, we don't even need to invest it in anything because look how well we're doing. We can just go party, right? Invite the family for a nice big dinner and, and go on vacation. That's going to be great. Uh, and here again, the more money we have, the, the worse and worse we consume it. Right? First, we buy the thing that we really, truly need, and then later the stuff that's kind of nice to have. So the more we print money, the more we overconsume, uh, which means we decrease the available set of scarce resources. Right? Every steak that we eat is one that's no longer in the freezer to be eaten for later. But now the, the worst part of inflation is that both of these two things happen at the same time. So we, we overproduce our, our resources and we overconsume our resources. And this is great, right? We're all thinking we're, we're rich at this moment. That's the boom period of the business cycle. The problem is when you start realizing that, oh, I thought that I can you know, finish the building that I just started because we were all so rich, we had so many resources all of a sudden. But no, all other entrepreneurs were building as well and, and consumers were taking away the resources in other places. So now we don't have any resources available to finalize the, the investments and, and the projects that we've started. Meaning a bust, half-finished houses, right? shops having to close down. That's economic depression. And, and the reason, the fundamental reason for this is because we started printing money. The great thing is, that means we have the easiest solution to prosperity and human flourishing. Just stop printing the money. Stop stealing from each other, and we will be filthy rich, all of us. Here's some great graphical slides from Bitcoin Educator, who's one of the best follows out there, Anil, on the amount of time that global reserve currencies have lasted throughout time. What you can see, starting with Spain in the 1500s, moving to the Netherlands in the 1600s, to France in the 1700s, the UK with the sterling and the pound in the 1800s, and starting from 1920, the United States dollar is a global reserve currency, they all have a shelf life. And eventually, they all meet their same conclusion and their same end. And why is that? Well, because these sovereign global superpowers tend to start to abuse that role as a global superpower over time. Back in the past, what they would do is they would clip the coins. So you would need more coins to buy the same amount of goods. And then they started blending different metals together or debasing the value or the weight of the metals by adding in lighter and lighter metals on top of the harder metals. And now what we do when we don't live in a world with physical dollars, we just print them digitally, as Neil Kashkari said in a 60-minute interview, with his eyes bigger than Jim Carrey and masked. The inevitable thing that happens is people are able to save less and less and they start to live paycheck to paycheck, and they have to work twice as hard in order to buy the same amount of goods. And everyone starts to feel the impact or see the symptoms of this money printing problem that we have. And over time, governments have never learned. But I think now we have an actual solution, and that's Bitcoin. If it's not Bitcoin, show me a better one, one that's interoperable, globally, that every government can use but not have issuance or power over top of, and is backed by 
the use and production of energy, which every country deems valuable around the world. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And one thing that I'm constantly rhyming about is our one mission at SWAN, which is to do what's right for Bitcoin and Bitcoiners and help millions of people along their Bitcoin journey. So one way we're doing that, the next way we're doing that is our Welcome to Bitcoin Q&A session at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. Pacific on Twitter Spaces. The link is in the show notes. We have Stefan Levera, who hosts one of the largest Bitcoin podcasts in the world with hundreds and hundreds of episodes, along with Swan co-founder Brady Swinson, and they answer Q&A or do open and live sessions for people that are just getting into Bitcoin. Not the experts, not the people who know everything there is to know about Bitcoin and custody and all of the advanced topics, but people like your friends and your family who ask you beginner level questions. And so, in order to collect more questions for their episode tomorrow, one, feel free to actually join the live session and ask your questions live. But if you'd like your questions represented, please do send me an email to daily at swanbitcoin.com and I will do my best to answer the questions like I do every day, or we will get them answered on our show tomorrow. Without a lot going on in the Bitcoin space today, this is a great day to keep stacking, not only sats, but in terms of your education. One saying that I love, use the dull periods to sharpen yourself. And with that, we're signing off for today. This is Dante Cook with Swan.com. Happy stacking.